Hey church family, welcome to another edition of Church at Home. Whether you're watching this on our live experience or you're going to watch it later, we say thank you for joining us today. If you're in our live experience, we have online pastors and leaders that want to chat with you. You can chat with them in the chat room there. There's also opportunities that connected to our digital communities right there in the chat room and ask any questions you want about the sermon. And if you're watching this later, we say welcome. This morning, we're going to go into a time of worship. So I want to invite you to create a space in your home or in your car, wherever you're watching this, uh, that's quiet, and you can prepare your heart to worship the Lord. I'm going to go ahead and pray us in. Father, this morning, we say thank you. Thank you for another day. You put breath in our lungs. You put purpose in our heart, and you gave us your son to follow. And we follow him all the days of our life. Even when things seem uncertain, Lord, we follow you. And we just say that again today, Lord, I will follow you in all the ways that you've been good to me. I say thank you right back, Lord. Take this time, take our worship, and make it beautiful unto you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so Me. There's 
Hey church, excited to be here with you today. If I have not yet met you, my name is Sam and I work as a youth pastor here at Captivate, but hope you guys are all doing well. Hope you are staying safe. But how many of you out there have been enjoying 2020 so far? <laughs> it's funny because I had a coach in high school tell me there's no such thing as a dumb question, but that one might break the rules right there. 2020, it's been a crazy year. It's been an interesting year. It's been a year in which we have things and we're going up against challenges that we probably never thought we'd have to face. It's been a year in which we, things have happened that we probably never could have expected or predicted. But to give you a, just an example, maybe a challenge that we faced personally that we weren't having to expect or go up against, my wife and I, we got three young kids at home and my oldest two, they're in first grade and kindergarten. And over the last two months, my wife and I, we stepped into this brand new role, this role of being homeschool teachers. That's right, homeschool teachers. It's something that I never thought I'd put on my resume, but it's something we've been doing. And I just want to say real quick, props to all the teachers out there. You guys are amazing. It's amazing what you do each and every day, investing into the lives of our kids. I think you all need a pay raise, but as our lead pastor says, that's probably another message for another day. Anyways, as I've been saying, in my personal experience of being a homeschool teacher, I just have this urge, this urge that I need to reach out and write maybe an email to my, my kids' real teachers, letting them know that, that they had a misprint on the last report card that they had sent home with our kids. Because again, from my experience as a homeschool teacher, the word joy would be the last word I would use to describe their presence in the classroom setting. <laughs> maybe I have some other parents out there who feel the same way. But going on this one word description, what is one word that you all would use to describe this first part of 2020? How has it been going for you? And this is the part of the service where I'd wait for some feedback, you know, hoping to hear what you guys would have to say. And the cool thing is you can respond in our chat on the live service. So go ahead and let it be known there. But I'm just going to have to go with my next best option. So I got Caleb here, Pastor Cal, the, the, the worship and creative pastor here at Captivate. He's here with me right now. He's recording this with me. And so, Cal, I think you are a man of the people. What would be one word that you think would describe 2020? <laughs> Caught him off guard a little bit. What would you say? Overwhelming. Overwhelming. That's a good one. That's a good one. I think, personally, I would have to go with the word crisis. Now, if we go to Google, great source for any information, we go to Google, Google defines crisis as this, a time of intense difficulty, trouble, or danger. And again, I think the, this, this, this virus, it fits perfectly in that. Again, a time of intense difficulty, check. Time of trouble, check. A time of danger, check. This virus basically sounds exactly like that, a crisis. But it's interesting because President JFK, he once said this, he said, when written in Chinese, the word crisis, it's composed of two characters. One represents danger, and the other one, it represents opportunity. And I believe that's true in today's case. Every crisis is also an opportunity at the same time. And I don't think it's any coincidence that a new church like Captivate has been in operation for only a year and a half. And we've seen God move in some amazing ways in this first year and a half. Like to be able to move into a multi-million dollar building 
on the one-year anniversary. That's unheard of. Or to see growth in church attendance that's five to six times that of the national average of a church in America. God's moving in some credible ways, yet I don't think it's any coincidence that Wes, our lead pastor, in January, given all the growth that we're going through, he leads us into this series titled Slowing Down, to slow down. A, a slow down, a series in which if you were to go to the experts, the people who know church plants, who know churches in them themselves, they probably would have said, that's actually the last thing you probably should do. You don't want to let off the gas pedal, but you want to push that throttle all the way to the floor. You want to seize on the momentum that you have right now. You want to make most of the opportunity that God has given you to continue to grow. But it's amazing because I think through Wes's decision to bring us into this series, to slow down, it actually, it actually prepared our hearts for what this opportunity now presents itself in this crisis. It prepared our hearts to be ready to make the most of the opportunity that we now see in this crisis. I also think that in his decision, he just basically exemplified and showed us the wisdom that's seen in Proverbs 3.5 where we're not relying on our own understanding, but we're simply trusting in God, trusting in what he's leading and being obedient and how, he, and how he's doing that. But this crisis right now, I truly believe it's an opportunity for all of us to slow down. Yeah, it may have been forced on us. It may be something that we did not want to do, but we're here and it's an opportunity. It's a unique opportunity we may never see again or never have again. But how are we going to use it? How are we going to use this time to grow in our relationship with God, to grow in knowing who he is and who he's meant to be in our lives? How are we going to use this time to slow down and simply fall more in love with him? And today I'm excited to continue our series that's titled Don't Wait. I hope you haven't been enjoying it as much as I have. And today I'm going to share with you a message that I don't think any of us should actually wait any longer for us to pursue and to go after. And that's for you to begin living your purpose. Now, I'm not sure what you think when I say that phrase, living your purpose. I'm not sure what you think or what you feel. Maybe for some of us in here, you just have like this, this gut-wrenching feeling or this hole in your stomach as I say that phrase because you think to yourself, I have no idea what that is. I don't even know where to begin. Or maybe you get excited when I say that phrase, to live out your purpose. You're like, yes, God, I know you have a purpose for me. But what does that maybe look like right now? What does that look like in the midst of a pandemic? Or maybe for some of us in here, for some of you watching today, when I say that phrase, living out your purpose, you may even have a feeling or a thought of anger or frustration towards God because you're thinking to yourself, God, I was living out my purpose, but then it was taken from me. It was taken from me because of this virus. So I'm not entirely sure what you're, where you're at. I'm not sure what, again, you think or what you feel when I say that phrase, living your purpose. But I do know this, that each and every one of us, we all still have a purpose to live. And I know the, the reason is that because when we, when we say yes to Jesus for the first time, when you say yes to Jesus, come in, be my Lord, be my Savior, be my everything. There's a reason why we're all not immediately vacuumed up to heaven in that moment. And the reason is, is because God still has a purpose for you to live out. It's a purpose that you can live out regardless of what's happening in your life. It's a purpose you can live out regardless of if we're in a pandemic or we're not in a pandemic. And it's a purpose that we can begin to live out as we see each day as a gift from God to live out this purpose that he has for you. So I'm excited because today's message, today's message, I've titled it, Don't Wait on Passion. That's right, don't wait on passion. And some of you be thinking like, did he just mess up his words? I thought we were going with purpose today. Why is his message titled about passion? And I'm going to say this because for 99.9% .9 of my life, I always thought my purpose was tied to the things I was doing. I always thought my purpose, maybe it was me being like, like the best son or the best brother, the best friend, or as I grew older, maybe it was me being the best husband or the best father to my kids. Or maybe I always saw my purpose as I got into my career. Maybe it's tied up or wrapped up in a career, like being a pastor. I mean, that seems like a noble purpose from God, right? But hear me out just real quick. The things that we all do in life, how well we perform at being a spouse or being a parent, how well you perform in any given career. All those things are temporary, but God has made you for eternity. And I believe that your purpose, it's not lived out through a temporary performance, but it's lived out through an eternal passion. And today we're going to be reading at Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 40. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and flip open. 
But also we got this really cool feature on the live stream. If you're watching right now, you can open up the Bible and follow along with us. Or if you happen to be like me and you're just a little too lazy, we're going to show the text up on the screen as well. But anyways, Matthew 25, just to give you guys a little bit of context. This chapter, it comes at the very end of Jesus' ministry. So this is one of the last things that he's teaching his disciples. But in this chapter, we see three different parables. Three different parables. In the first two, the parable of the ten bridesmaids and the parable of the three servants, they actually speak specifically to maybe what our purpose looks like. They talk about how we are to use the gifts, the, the, the talents, the things that God has given us, our resources, to give them back to him and to make sure that we glorify him. And they also share the truth that we're to live our life in such a way that we're always ready, always expectant for him to come back in the second glorious return. But this third parable, the one that we're reading from today, it's known as the final judgment. And again, it's found in verses 31 through 40. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of different opinions out there when it comes to this parable on the final judgment. There's a lot of different opinions, the, the details, the who, the what, the when, all that is still heavily debated among scholars. But I think from this passage, Jesus, he makes it clear that his purpose for us, it's not fulfilled through a, a particular task or action, but it's fulfilled through an unrestrained passion for him. Again, Matthew 25, verses 31, Jesus says this in verse 31. He says, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into, my, into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And I think as we go through these actions, we can agree that these actions in of themselves are good. In fact, it reminds me of what it says in James 2, that these actions actually would validate the faith that we claim to have in Jesus. And I think these are the actions that we all desire to do as followers of Jesus. But here, I don't think these actions actually describe the purpose he has for you. In fact, I think Jesus sheds a little bit more light on what that purpose looks like in the next few verses. Verse 37, he continues. Jesus says this. He says, Then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when do we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When do we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it for me. You were doing it for me. That's the part that really sticks out. Now, I think it's, it's obvious that when Jesus, he's talking about serving other people, that his, he wasn't literal in the fact that, that, that his disciples, that we, his followers, were literally serving him, right? As we're loving other people, we don't literally see Jesus as we're serving them. In fact, it, it says this because in, in 37 and 39, we see how they respond. They're like, Jesus, what are you talking about? I don't remember ever giving you food. I don't remember ever giving you something to drink. I, I, sh I for sure don't ever remember seeing you naked, so how could I have given you clothing? And they, they probably respond, I hope you weren't the guy that I saw in prison. So how did we do all these things? And again, Jesus, in his response, he affirms that those who are counted as righteous, it's interesting because he doesn't say, well done, you who created and, and built this Fortune 500 company. He doesn't say, well done, you who, who church planted and started 50 new churches in your lifetime. He doesn't even say, well done for sharing who I am with that one other person in your life. But he makes it clear that those who counted as righteous, those who counted as righteous are those who love him by loving others. Love him by loving others. Those that you did to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Love him by loving others. You all know who lived this out really well who would be the perfect description of the, those who counted as righteous in this passage that Jesus is talking about. And that person would be none other than Mother Teresa. And I love how last week we got an intro into Mother Teresa's life and her upbringing and her parents. But again, Mother Teresa, her life she just exuded the love of Jesus. She was known for having a passion for the poor. And it's interesting because she was in an interview, and the interviewer, he just comments to her. He says, it's amazing to see your passion that you have for the poor. And she responds kind of shockingly. She says, I don't have a passion for the poor. 
And I can only imagine the interview. He's caught off guard. His, his mouth has to like drop to the ground or something because he, she sees his shock. And she simply responds in this way. She explained that her passion, it was for Jesus. He has a passion for the poor, so then she served the poor. And that's the thing, to love Jesus, to serve others. It's not for us to be motivated by approval or by an accomplishment or even by the idea that maybe one day if I do this act, I'll be on the right side of this judgment. But to love Jesus, to live like him, is to make sure that our motivation is the same as his was. It's to make sure our motivation is to love God by doing what he asks. And I love what Wes shared earlier in the series about how how our obedience to God, that's, that's the volume dial to his voice in our life. Or in other words, as we're more obedient to how God is leading, it becomes more clear of what he's actually asking us to do, of how he's leading you in your life. But what I think the life of Jesus shows us, that what you are obedient to are the things that you're actually passionate for. And as we read through the gospel, as you see his life story unveiled, as it it becomes into this, this amazing thing, we begin to see that Jesus, his main purpose in life, it was simple. It was to love God by doing what God had asked him to do. Jesus, in another part of the gospels, he says this. He says, he only does what the Father shows him to do. He only does what the Father tells him to do. His actions, his miracle, his service, and his love towards other people. His, his death on the cross for you and I. It'd be hard to say that any one of those actions actually fulfilled his purpose. But it's much easier to say that through all of them, Jesus was living his purpose because he was simply loving God with the greatest of passions. Like Jesus, your purpose is fulfilled through your passion. And that passion is simply to love God with all you got. And you may be agreeing in your heart, maybe with what God's word is revealing to you right now or what the Spirit's speaking to you. That's the way I felt as I kind of jumped into this text with Matthew 25. I was like, yes, God, that's so awesome. I, I, I desire so much to love you. I desire so much to love you and to live in such a way where I love other people because I love you so much. My heart, your heart may be screaming that too like it was for me. But on the, on the outside, in our minds, our minds begin to race. They go to our circumstances. They begin to remind us of all the things that are happening on, around us. They begin to remind us of the crisis we find ourselves in. And I'm not sure where you guys may be at. I have no idea what this crisis has done maybe to you. I have no idea what it's done to your job. I have no idea what it's done to your life. But I do know this. I do know it's shaken all of us. I do know that, it, that it's jolted us in, a, in an incredible way. I know that it's changed the way that life looks for all of us in a completely new way. But I want to share with you a quick story. Some of you know that I have not been in vocational ministry for too long. Before this, I worked for 10 years running a financial advisory practice with my grandfather and brother. Loved doing that. It was a great job. So I've only been a youth pastor for about the last year and a half or about the time since Captivate launched. But in that, in that last year and a half, like Captivate's kind of had a crazy story in this last year and a half. I'd say that my year and a half in youth ministry has been just as crazy. It's been a year and a half in which God has really stretched my faith. It's been a year and a half that's been filled with different difficulties and different challenges and actually quite a bit of failures, which has been hard to go through. But I remember when we first launched, for that first year or so, we literally had like five or six teenagers in the entire church. So I'd find myself on Sunday mornings preaching to like three or four teenagers at a time. And if you want to talk about something that's challenging or something that's awkward, that was that in that moment. It was super hard. And there were times where I'd get frustrated with God. I'd be like, go to him and be like, why? Right? I thought you called me to do this. I thought this was what you wanted me to do. Why, why, am, why, why did I leave my career to preach to three or four teenagers at a time, right, where one's falling asleep and the other two are just like staring back at me with these blank stares? And even though my heart doubted at times, God, he remained faithful. He remained faithful because the summer before we moved into our building, we began to see God move in some incredible ways, some ways in which I never thought were even possible. Not only were we able to launch a successful youth night here at Captivate, but I, we saw God move in some amazing ways at our local campuses, in the high school, in the middle school of our faith clubs. He was working in some amazing ways. In about a five-month period, I saw God grow this ministry to one that was impacting three or four students a week, to one that was impacting hundreds a week. But what he showed me in that, he showed me this. He said, if you're passionate about the few, I can turn your purpose into the hundreds. If you're passionate about the few, he can turn your purpose into the hundreds. And he wants you, to, he just wants to know, 
Are you passionate about the few as you would be about the hundred? Do you carry the same amount of passion? And it's not just for ministry. Say it's money. If you had three dollars to give, would you be just as passionate to give and to help somebody else? Say as if you had maybe a hundred or thousands or millions of dollars to do just a thing. Or if you had one person in your life in which you could pray for and have influence over, would you be just as passionate about that one person than say the opportunity as if you had a hundred people you can influence? Because your passion, if you're as passionate about the few as you are the hundred, you begin to realize you don't need the hundreds. And you begin to realize that your purpose, it's not tied up in the hundreds. And I wish I realized this before the crisis hit because things were going great. They were. For the first time in life, I thought I was actually doing what I was supposed to be doing. I thought I was living out my purpose. And then all of a sudden, probably for like a lot of you, all of a sudden it was gone. It was taken away. It was just like that. It like disappeared. It was, I was hit. I was shaken. It was a challenge. It's something that was hard to process, and I think it's something that I'm actually still processing with God. But in it, he's been showing me that when, we're, when things are stripped away from us, it reveals exactly where you are placing your passion in life. And based on my reaction to the whole thing, to the virus, I could say with confidence that my passion, it wasn't 100% on God, but actually it was more so on what I could do for God. For me, living out my purpose, it had to do with my ability. I had seen it, my purpose as the success or the failure of me as a youth pastor. But here's the thing. God, he's not in love with what you can do. He's in love with you. Again, he's not in love with what you can do. He's in love with you. He did not give up his life to get something out of you. But he gave up his life to live in you. He gave up his life so that you can know intimately the God of the universe. He gave up his life so that you can just have the smallest understanding of how much he truly loves you. He gave up his life so that the king of kings can become your greatest passion in life. So will things ever go back to normal? It's hard to say. I hope so. But in the same breath, just as I hope that things go back to normal, I hope that I go back a little bit changed. I hope I go back changed in the way of where I'm actually directing my passion in life. You see, through all this, God has convinced me that living out your purpose, it doesn't start with a resume, it doesn't start with a degree, but it actually starts within your own heart. Jesus, in Luke Luke 6, 45, he says this. He says, out of the virtue stored in their hearts, good and upright people will produce good fruit. But out of the evil hidden in their hearts, evil ones will produce what is evil. For the overflow of what has been stored in your heart will be seen by your fruit and will be heard in your words. Again, I just love that last part. For the overflow of what has been stored in your heart will be seen by your fruit and heard in your words. Or in other words, it's going to be obvious what's inside of you. It's going to be obvious about what your heart is chasing. It's going to be obvious to the world around you of what you're passionate about. But I believe this. Is I believe that as our passion for him grows, as he becomes our greatest passion in life, his, his beauty begins to naturally be reflected through us to those around us. But speaking of just things that are beautiful or things that take your breath away, how many of you have been, had the opportunity over the last few weeks to go to some of our local beaches at night and see the bioluminescent waves? Cal, have you had a chance to see them? Not yet. No, not yet. I don't know if they're still going. But about a few weeks ago, we, we drove by, and for the first time i ever seen this, it was incredible. It really, literally blew me away. Like we were driving down Sunset Cliffs, and it was hard for me to put my attention back on the road as I was driving because These waves, as they crash at night, they just glow this amazing, bright, luminescent blue color. It's just, it's beautiful. There's no other way to describe it. But these bioluminescent waves, the science behind it is actually somewhat interesting. Essentially, it's caused by these organisms called phytoplankton. And maybe you're like me, you fell asleep in high school biology class that day. But according to Google, these phytoplankton, they're microalgae, but they are a living organism. But they act essentially as like the glue for our ecosystems and our oceans. But here's the thing. Yes, they move and they swim like a creature, but they process energy similar to that of the plant. Or in other words, they need light to survive. So if you go to the ocean during the day, all you'll see is like this icky, ugly, reddish brown color in the ocean. And that's essentially the phytoplankton. They're trying to get to the surface. They're trying to get as much exposure to the sun and to the light as possible. But at night, when these phytoplankton, when they're agitated, when they're jolted, when they're shocked, when they're caught off guard, like with a wave crashing over them, they have this natural self-defense mechanism built into them, and that's when they emit 
this amazing color, this bioluminescence. And again, it's something that they don't have to work at. It's something that they don't have to try to produce, but it's something that comes naturally from within them. It comes from the inside out. And like the phytoplankton, I can't help but think, when the world comes at us hard, like it is right now with this virus, when we're jolted in an unexpected way, what's your natural reaction? Your words, your actions, what is it letting known to the world around you what's inside your heart? Because like the phytoplankton, you and I, we were made to shine and make known this incredible light that's within us, regardless of what's happening around us. We were made to show that joy is possible in a circumstance where joy feels like it's the furthest thing that can, that can actually happen. Or peace, peace in a situation where people are afraid, they're terrified, they're not sure what to do. You were meant to share this light. But like the phytoplankton as well, we can only do this. This can only become a natural reaction if we're willing to spend time in the light, if we're willing to spend time with God. And that's the thing. You see, there is no replacement for intimacy with Jesus. There is. There's no replacement for intimacy with Jesus. None. Nothing comes close to feeling your passion for God like just being with Him, simply being alone with Him. And it makes me think of just the, the amazingness of, of this relationship with him. But like any relationship, like any great relationship, it's going to take a little bit of work. It's going to take a little bit of effort. And I think God, he's actually given us relationships with other people, people we can be close and intimate with, to actually show us what's required if we desire the same thing in a relationship with him. So for me, the first relationship I think about is the relationship I have with my wife. I love her to death. I could not imagine life without her. But I also could not imagine a life in which my relationship with her was stagnant, in which it wasn't growing, in which I wasn't discovering more of who she is or more of the ways in which we work together or discovering more of the ways in which I can love her in just different situations. But this growth, the growth that we desire in this relationship, yeah, it takes effort and it takes work, but I know it's going to be happen because I love her and I have a passion for her. But as I think about my relationship with my wife, I think of some of the, the basic, necessary things that, that, are, that are required for not just this relationship to function, but for this relationship to actually grow and to thrive. And then I begin to think, am I, am I missing some of these things in my own relationship with Jesus? The first thing I think about when it comes to any relationship that's absolutely necessary is communication. And we all know that communication, it's a two-way street. But if you were to take inventory of your prayer life, if you looked at your own prayer life, would you say that that is true about your relationship with Jesus, that communication is indeed a two-way street? For a lot of my life, I would say that it was definitely not the case, where I was doing essentially 100% of the talking. And God has been showing me that prayer, prayer is not meant for you to talk at God, but it's meant for you to talk with God. And maybe you're like me. Maybe you need to make your relationship with Jesus look a little bit more like a normal relationship, a relationship that you have with another per person where he actually begins to do more of the talking and you begin to do more of the listening. And maybe we start taking some of the advice, advice like in Psalms 46, where we simply are still. We're still before him and we remember who God is. It's not us, but it's him. And now we're just still, but we actually come before him. Maybe we're asking him questions as we go throughout the day. Maybe in our prayer time, we come before him, not with our request, but we go, God, what is it that you want to share with me? What is it that you want me to pray about right now? What is it that you want to make known to my heart? And if, if communication is number one, when I think of things that are required for any relationship, I think a close second has to be quality time. And I think, have I missed any of this in my relationship with Jesus? Have I missed any of this quality time that I so value and need with other relationships? And again, like the phytoplankton and the example we had there, if I'm not spending enough time in the light, if I'm not spending enough time in God's presence, it's going to be obvious to those around me, right? My wife would be the first one to tell you if I've actually spent time with Jesus that day or if I haven't. And I begin to see it in my own actions and the way I respond to certain situations and the way I respond to homework during homeschooling. I can see it in the way I respond. I know or not if I have been with Jesus. That quality time, it's so important. But what he's been showing me in these last two months of quarantine is there's these opportunities. There's these opportunities to establish some new rhythms. And one of my favorite rhythms in which I've been able to actually spend a little bit more quality time with him has been as simple as going on a walk around the block. It's like a third of a mile, and it maybe takes me 12 or 15 minutes. I go at a slow pace. 
but it's been a time in which I basically need every single day. It's a time in which there's no work, there's no kids, but it's simply me and God. It's simply me being able to be with him. And as I begin to spend more quality time with him, it just, it, 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 I begin to sense it within myself. Again, that peace, the joy, it, it, it comes in a way that, again, we don't think is possible. But at the same time, it just gives me a heart of thankfulness, a heart of gratitude because of the thought that the God of the universe, the God of the universe, he loves me so much that he's willing to be alone with me right now in this moment. So I would just encourage you, what are some things that you begin to establish, some new rhythms in this time of slowing down that you can then take with you to build on your passion, to build on your relationship with Jesus? And look, I'm just going to close with this last verse. Philippians 3.8. And Paul, the guy who wrote this, I think he knew a thing or two when it came to living out his purpose. I mean, he's, he's a guy who wrote nearly two-thirds of the New Testament. And when it comes to church planning, Paul was the guy who invented church planning. He's the one who started it. He was the first one to start churches for Jesus. Yet in this one verse, again, Philippians 3.8, he tells us where actually his passion truly lies. He says this in verse 8. He says, yes, everything else is worthless. Everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. There it is. There's all of it right there. Paul, he's saying there is no accomplishment. There is no success. There is no thing that he could ever achieve that ever comes close to intimately knowing Jesus. Jesus is his passion. Jesus is his very purpose. So I have a few questions as we close. And the first question is this, is do you know him? Do you know Jesus? If you say no to this, maybe today is day one of you saying yes to this relationship with him. Maybe today is day one of you saying, yes, Jesus, I realize what you did for me. I realize who I am and I realize how much I need you. Come into my life. If that's you, I'd love to pray for you in just a moment. And we're going to do that in a little bit. But if that's not you, maybe you already know Jesus. I have this question for you. Have you been living with the same mindset that we see in Paul in this one verse, Philippians 3, 8. Have you actually been living in your purpose where Jesus becomes your greatest passion in life? You see, the amazing thing is, is you never arrive when it comes to your relationship with Jesus. There's always more of him to discover, always more to learn about him, and always more ways in which we can simply fall in love with him. And I think he's asking all of us right now in the midst of the opportunity we see in this crisis, is he's asking you, how are you able to shift your passion so it's directed to him. So it's directed to your purpose. And how will you use this unique opportunity to invest in this relationship with him? Let's pray real quick, church. Father, we just thank you so much for who you are. God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we just thank you how your spirit, it's here, it's present, and it's speaking to us right now. God, I just thank you so much for what you showed us. I thank you for the people who are wanting to say yes to you right now for maybe the first time. They're realizing who they are. They're realizing their actual need for you. And they're wanting more of you in their life. So, Father, we just pray in the quietness of our heart. We say this to you. God, we need you. We invite you in. We ask that you become our Lord and Savior. We realize that we're broken. We realize that we're in need of you. And, God, we want to turn from our ways and turn to you. As we give all of ourselves to you, we're in an understanding that you will give all of yourself to us. God, we thank you that you invite us into this relationship, a relationship that frees us, frees us from the inside out and changes us. And we're excited to see what that change looks like. And God, I lift up the people to you right now who maybe already know you, but you're putting on their hearts, you're directing them, you're asking them to direct their passion a little bit more towards their purpose. And that purpose is essentially you. Show them, Father, show us, show me how we begin to love you in a better way by simply loving those around us. God, we thank you so much for the passion that you showed for us, how you went to the cross. You gave all of you were, Father, just so that we can know you. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you again for being here right now. Lord, we ask that the things you are doing right now in our hearts, that they create a real change. They not only create a real change in us, but they create a change in the relationship we have with you and they create a change in the world in which we find ourselves in. Thank you, Jesus. We love you so much. It's your name we pray.
Amen. Hello, church family. As we get into worship, we're going to be singing a new song. It's called The Blessing. This song comes straight from scripture. It's a blessing of God's favor upon families and generations to come. And as I was thinking about the generations to come and how Pastor Sam was preaching on intimacy with God and living out your passion, um, I thought of someone in my life who's really lived out that passion and intimacy with God. And that person is my grandma. And I've been able to really see her live out that true, real relationship with Jesus. And I just know that from her faithfulness and her belief in God has passed down through the generations. And there's a part in this song that says, may his favor be upon you from generations to generations to your families and your children and their children. And it's such a powerful song. And let it be a reminder to us that as we live out our walk with Jesus, that it's a real intimate relationship with him, that we know it's not just doing something for us, but it could be doing something for the generations to come, for our families and our children. And I just want to encourage you that as we sing this song, just be praying that blessing over your families. And we're praying that over your families as well. Join in with us right now.
to be one of my favorite new songs. I love that song, The Blessing, and we really find in it this beautiful truth that God is always with us, and He always goes before us. And so wherever you are in life, we pray this time has blessed you. We pray the worship blessed you and the message blessed you. If you want to continue and further the conversation, we're going to have a devotional in the chat room. We'll we'll drop the link in there. Also on the website, you can click on the notes button right under the sermon and a devotional will pop up for you and the entire family and we have a ton of stuff for the kids online on our youtube channel at captivate church make sure you check it out and go through it with the kids you'll you'll find it's really a blessing to them and wherever you're watching from today i want to invite you in to one of our captivate digital communities doesn't matter if you're in san diego or wherever you are in the world you can join a digital community because these are happening all online all throughout the week If you want to sign up for a community and always know you have someone in your corner praying for you and to walk through anything of life with you, 
man, go ahead and email me at communities at CaptivateSD.com. Or you can also click the Join a Community button right in the chat room there on your screen. As always, we want to say a huge thank you for your generosity here to Captivate Church. Thank you for all who give and call Captivate Church your home church. It is really allowing us to create and make disciples of Jesus all over the world. So we say thank you to you. And I just want to invite you into this verse today. James 1.17 says this, says, Every good and perfect gift comes from God above. God really gives us gifts to be generous with. And if you sense God inviting you to give today, we always want to give you an opportunity to do so. You can click the link give in the chat room, or you can head to CaptivateSD.com forward slash give, and you can give right online. Thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you so much again for joining us today for Church at Home. Hey, go ahead and share this message with someone in your life that you know needs to hear it, and then make sure you join us again next week right here online. We pray you have an incredible week. We'll see you again soon, church family.